welcome to the 261st session of legal empowerment through interaction lecture series the pandemic would have waned the limitation period the concession given by the supreme court may end by the end of this month but the journey that we started during the pandemic time continues and uh, uh, we have a wonderful session today and special thanks to our family member radha krishna murthy because uh, it is he who gets us good speakers and uh, we are indeed indebted to him and today on the topic of need of administrative practices for constitution barons with reference to indian scenario we have senior mm -hmm. advocate sri reguram sir and to introduce the topic and the subject and uh, for the uh, uh, rendering the introductory remarks uh, we are thankful that we have uh, justice dvs somaya jalu sir we are indebted to justice ram kumar sir for his valuable presence as well and all of you wonderful participants let us without wasting any time get on with the session and directly over to you somaya jalu sir thank you thank i hope that was a slip of the tongue i cannot introduce the topic that justice Rag the sri ragaram is going to talk about he is eminently qualified to do that i will introduce the person <laughs> yes sir so i'll be excused because i mean i like mr radha krishnamurthy said he is an outstanding human being one of the most respected seniors that the combined courts of telangana and andhra pradesh have a man of immense knowledge but of absolute humility everybody and anybody is welcome to pick on his brains despite a shortage of time he always finds time to help advise and guide the youngsters anybody else who has a problem i mean i am also waiting with bated breath to hear him he comes from an impeccable judicial lineage his father yes. justice kodandra megar was one of the most distinguished judges that are, that the combined state ever had a scholarly man man of very great learning great uh, piety deeply religious but very very well versed in commercial laws also and ragram garu has succeeded him and has proved himself to be a worthy son of a worthy father in fact i have one grievance against him and said when i was handling one particular portfolio there was a question of freedom of speech how far can the politicians go in the election meetings i requested him to be the amicus curiae the topic started unfortunately because of the change in the roster we couldn't complete it but you know i was very hopeful that with his guidance we could have had some good law on the subject we had some very virulent and uh, if i may say so politically charged speeches we wanted to define the limit to which a politician can actually speak even during the elections unfortunately my bad luck it couldn't happen <clears throat> as you all know i mean radha krishnamurthy is very right he is one of the top two or three councils in this combined states of andhra pradesh and telangana very respected for his work very sought after yet he has time for every as you all know his younger brothers this is narsimha has now been elevated to the supreme oh, oh, so he is the younger brother i mean one son is named after the badrachalam rama the other is named after the simhachalam narsimha so <laughs> his father <laughs> used to donate i mean on the occasions he used to ensure that anadanam used to be conducted and you know both are worthy sons of a very worthy father and i know if he was kodandarama he is sri ragaram and then you have narsimha so i don't want to take much more of your time you are in for a treat and i am sure you'll agree with what all i have said at the conclusion of the meeting ragram garu after you we'll be waiting a uh, very humble sir for such kind words oh, no, no, i don't no. think i truly deserve such a liberal <laughs> comments on me but uh, uh, i have to live up to the the occasion i'll try my best you know because in this uh, in subject is very dear to me firstly it was introduced to me by my late father so that's very dear to me and he was an ardent student of administrative law uh, why i'm giving this introduction is that uh, the topic goes with this particular effort to learn administrative law so my father introduced to me administrative law and said that this is uh, a subject which has to be very abstract you need to make a lot of effort to really not only learn you will also have to imbibe the principles in administrative law if you want to become a good lawyer judge is a is a continuation or it's a another facet of uh, uh, lawyership so this subject administrative law i have been very and i have been now just last week on 10th i have completed my 40 years of practice mm -hmm. at high court so and i have been since my father introduced to me in administrative law 
I'll also add a few words how he used to work on this administrative law. He got enrolled in 1952, just after the constitution was uh, framed. From 1952 to his elevation in 1982, every administrative law judgment is recorded by him. Every we used to get AIR as a monthly journal. So this is also important. My topic. I am not. I am not diverting, but it may be important. Just five minutes. I'll take on this interest. So administrative law. What he did is that that is very intriguing for me. Is that he divided the subject in his own categories. Those headings which he has made in his notebook, but you will not find anywhere in the textbook. That is the greatness of the the person. Administrative law, for example, estoppel is there. It it may be one facet. Immediately there you will have accusations. So other facet of estoppel. So these things you will not find in textbooks. Administrative law, law textbooks. Let's say it's a Dain and Dain or Takwani or what whatever you followed in the college. Unfortunately, not many authors in India uh, only basically follow Jain and Jain. And I'm a great fan of uh, English administrative law. I follow administrative law by Wade and Smith, which I think they're very. Uh, uh, I would say up to the point. If you have any doubt, you will get us a clarity from English law. So what I'm trying to say is this subject. Though is of great importance, is also very vague. It has to be an effort has to be made to learn it. And why should we learn administrative law? Second point, uh, before coming to the key point of uh, or subject, we should learn administrative law because it is the it's the the performance of two twenty six judicial review is only through administrative law. There is no other law which is required. In fact, either administrative law is a substantive law or a procedural law. If you go to a classical division, it may not be been so necessary. But I would say it is more of a procedural law. There is no substantive law in administrative law. As as Wade puts it, between an appeal and a judicial review, the distinction is in an appeal the court looks at the right or wrong of the judgment, where a judicial review. Look at the process in which the authority has come to the conclusion, not the merits of that conclusion. So therefore, it is a again a procedural law. So therefore, it is required to learn administrative law to administer two twenty six. So administration of two twenty six in a court consists of two parts. One, the lawyer; another is the judge. It is not that the judge only should know the administrative law and not the lawyer. In my conclusion remarks, I will come to that. That for development of this administrative law, a combined effort of the lawyer and judge is required, and then only this law can be taken for. This uh, opening remarks, I will just go to the subject. I don't want to. Put a lot of case law and the principles and all that. All are, I have a panel which is very eminent and everybody knows the fundamentals and specializations. Also, I just have to indicate and they know the uh, point which I am trying to make. So therefore, I only put the contours and my uh, anxiety and uh, uh, I would say my enthusiasm to drive at the point that we need to today take administrative law. Into a a a, a gear which is required a speedy a speedy development of administrative law. In one way, I am very um, saddened that administrative law is almost getting atrophied. There is atrophy in administrative law, according to me. If I can observe as a student of administrative law, the law developed by our eminent judges from 1950 to say 1890. Somehow, after the 21st century. principles which are required to be followed by the courts in its administration has not been has not been developed and somehow it's not been uh, pointed out and, and not been shown importance so what happens if you, you don't develop principles of administrative law is that when you adjudicate a petition under 226 you do it on the mostly equity and justice the law it goes to the background 
So therefore, I see as a regular practitioner in courts of law for 26, the effort of the lawyer seems to be to just appeal to the equity of the court. The judge, once he's convinced, I'm not saying it is not required, which is a very important facet of 26, equity and justice, but law is also important. Why law is important is it is a guidance to the administrator and as well as to the courts which follow subsequently to adjudicate this subject. So in that uh, perspective, I'll just give introduction to what exactly I'm looking at. If you look at the distinction between constitutional law and administrative law, the students of uh, the law, firstly, in the administrative law is taught nowadays in first year. I don't know why they are teaching uh, administrative law in the first year. I think it should be taught in the final year. After knowing all the law and the constitutional law perfectly, they should be taught administrative law. However, administrative law as a matter of uh, uh, course, they have been taught in the first year. And we have a topic. What is the connection between constitutional law and administrative law? And uh, the relationship. Is it independent or it is interdependent. It is a very large uh, topic. I do not want to go into it, but I, it is necessary for me to formulate a principle out of it. So I would go straight to a definition given by Go Hood and Phillips in his, in, uh, his Constitutional Law and Administrative Law textbook. He calls Constitutional Law as is concerned with the organization, functions of government at rest. Whereas, Administrative law is concerned with functions when institution is in motion. So therefore, administrative law is the dynamics of constitutional law. It, it is so very important that you cannot have constitutional practices without following the principles of administrative law. And this, that, that is what the distinction between, for my purpose, I would say, that administrative law is no way different from constitutional law. In fact, it is constitutional law in practice. And it is the law which is required for the constitutional courts to administer justice under Article 226 or Article 32. Now, administrative law is being administered, as I said, under 226 and 32 of the constitution. And uh, this, it has two parts. Administrative law, the authors of administrative law divide it into two parts. One, the rules and regulations of administrative law. The second part is the judge-made law. Now, rules and regulations are made by the legislature Delegate through delegated legislation by the executive. And what is delegated legislation? It is also part of administrative law. The exercise of delegated, delegated legislation is also part of administrative law. It's a huge topic which we would take for a different date and it's not concerning the topic of the day. So going further from the second part of this division of administrative law into rules, regulations, and the judgment law, let us examine the role of courts in the, in the creation of administrative law. The constitutional courts under our constitution, as per Article 215 and uh, I think it's, uh, 129, the both are courts of record. Both the court of record, which a court of record, as all of us know, is a court whose proceedings are recorded and are available for evidence of fact. This is a simple definition of court of record. Therefore, all the records of the court under 226 or 32 are also recorded and they are available for, for uh, uh, as a part of evidence of fact. Now, this particular court of record creates a judgment which has 
a precedent value. These precedents, which is also called, as you can put it in one way, is a doctrine of star diseases. These judgments of the High Court under 226 would also be a, a, is also a precedent and which is which I'm comparing it to star diseases. That is meaning stand by matters decided. So what is it, what happens when it is a case of star diseases or a, a, a precedent? that it binds the parties and it binds the subsequent education on the ratio similarly arising. What is additional point things about why I'm talking about precedent, which is common for civil law also, but what is so distinct for the 226? So my observation is that 226 binding nature through a president not only binds the parties and create but creates law by itself. Now, in other cases of civil law, a president is a principle of law which may be a judgment in personum and also a principle of judgment in rep, which binds the parties who come for in a subsequent litigation when this similar issue arises. It binds the parties. But in 226, it makes law by itself. It is a legislation by the, by the judge because it is a guidance to the executive. There is no other guidance. Fortunately or unfortunately, our country do not have statutes of administrative law as in case of America and started from France, the APA, Administrative Procedures Act of America, which lays down the procedures for the administrators to follow. It incorporates the agency's procedures, incorporating all those principles of administrative law. It's the statute of administrative law. And still the courts in the US also under judicial review lay down their own law. So they have two strengthening points, uh, areas where they can draw source of law is APA as well as judicial review. Whereas in our country, it is only the judicial review which creates the law for the executive also. So my emphasis is that this administrative law has two phases, a phase towards the executive, a phase towards the litigant as a precedent. So this is the importance of administrative law. It not only lays down a proper, it's a, facet of rule of law, important aspect of rule of law is judicial review under 226 because it establishes rule of law by directing the executive to follow these principles. This is the rule of law. You can't go beyond these principles. If you violate, it amounts to abuse of the process or abuse of law and uh, the court will correct it. So they are to be bound within these principles laid down with the court which is a, normally the function of a legislature. Legislature makes the law and the administrator executive follows the law. And if there's a violation of that statute, then the court will come to step in to correct the violation. Here, the court itself makes the law and asks them to follow it. This is the function of administrative law, how it is created. So the judgment law is, is the law which both administrator as well as the judiciary would follow. As the judiciary is concerned, law of precedent and the administrator is concerned, the direction of rule of law. Then let us see what is the scope of 226 and 32. I would more focus on 226 because 226 is held to be a larger uh, jurisdiction than 32, which is confined only to a fundamental right enforcement. The statute right enforcement is also there in 226. So powers, if you look at the powers of 226, liberal judges have called it as uh, sky is the limit. And uh, a skeptical executive have called it overreach of the judiciary. Recently, there's a lot of debate on this conflict between the so-called overreach and uh, 
sky is the limit for both of them if i would say administrative law is the line which they should not cross neither the judiciary would cross the administrative law principles nor would the executive to cross the administrative law principles so it is the right time for us to really focus on administrative law development according to me my theme of this particular topic of today's talk is that if it is truly followed to the hilt there will not be these frictions which we are seeing nowadays the understanding of administrative law by the executive and the performance of administrative law by the judiciary would reduce all these frictions there is so much misinformation with the executive with regard to administrative law they are not understanding that judiciary is the i was uh, at the risk of repetition i must just formulate this point so that it is a judiciary which is this is making the they are saying why are you making the law i have to perform according to my way but your way of performance is only whims and fancies so i have to make rules judiciary has to make the rule you follow this way for example I just make a simple point follow principles of natural justice statute may not have it but courts have rule so wherever there are rights involved you need to follow principles of natural executive would say it's not there in the statute why would they follow but the judge made the law so you have to follow so executive do not understand today that apart from the statute the overwhelming or the judicial pronouncements are the law for them to follow not merely judgments so this is the uh, lack of understanding of the executive which is really making them little jittery and restless so it's very important that we set and understand the powers under 226 sky is the limit is truly a correct statement because unless that kind of freedom and power is given to the judiciary the constitutional ethos will be lost the freedom will be lost then the question will be what is the excess of judiciary these are all aberrations i think there the, there is a lot of uh, of intolerance bus tolerance is bit of aberrations from judgments of the judges should be tolerated because they are passing on but they are also following the principles their the law is laid down so therefore they are making effort to make a law they follow so they have a great exercise to do to perform so therefore who can be six should be considered as a power which which is sky is the limit because ultimate protector of rights of the including fundamental rights of citizen is the judiciary i am not saying because i am part of the judicial system but i am only saying it because so the constitutional rights will be protected only this way you can't hand it over to the legislature or to the executive it is ultimately the judiciary under 226 they have to do it. now coming to self restraint so we have to talk about our house 226 how do we perform without earning the comment of excesses from the executive or the people who are so called affected by it is only to follow the principles of ethics then what is i have already st- uh, stated that judge made law is a law so how do we make how does a judge make law judge makes law activist judge travels from a to z straight away but a common law judge who follows a bit of precedent value would follow from would come to z only after he travels through the other stages of b to z this is a, a very good uh, topic which was discussed by professor atiya in his uh, hamlin law lecture called the pragmatism in english law he says that the principle of following the precedent step wise a to b b to c that way and ultimately you may come to z and z would be diametrically opposite to a but it takes time and sinks into the people people have some kind of a understanding of the development of law and certainty these are two important facets 
for developing law that the litigants should have a certainty, should understand a certain litigants and the lawyers also, should have understand a certainty of law. This is a statement of Lord Denny in 1917 and all England reports. And if the lawyers who advise the clients do not know what is the precedent to be followed, and an activist judge travels from that state away in a different uh, uh, zone, how would a lawyer advise the clients? I'm not using my words, these are the words of Lord Denny. So, how would a client, a lawyer, advise the client? So, this is the way to go about in precedent. So I would uh, suggest and say that this is the best way to go about, as suggested by Professor Atiya, travel from one precedent to another precedent. Travel slowly, develop the law stage wise. Don't straight away go to an activist way of judging, which will be very uh, kind of disturbing the, the complete uh, scenario because why the judge would not the the litigant public or the executive would not understand why is this this may be a justice but then you need to develop the principle stage wise now we can examine uh, one or two topics a simple topic which all of us know would be principles of natural justice the courts have laid down after a uh, on the advent of the constitution, let us take the principles of natural justice and the right of hearing as an, as an example. In Kripa case in 1970, the court laid down, this is Hegde speaking to the court, laid down the principle that the two principles laid down in the Kripa, which is a landmark judgment for bias and the right of hearing. So whenever an, uh, a party's right is affected, he should be heard before passing any order. That was 1970. Then we traveled to 1978. Manaka Gandhi said that right of hearing cannot be incorporated in the statute, even if it is not incorporated no specific provision is there in the statute for the proposed action and, and uh, uh, for, for providing principles of natural justice. It is a duty of the executive to authority or administrative authority to give notice and also to give reasonable notice. So, Kripaka said give uh, uh, hearing. Manaka Gandhi traveled a little further. There are two other uh, points with Manaka Gandhi made, but I'm only trying to see the gradation of the development of principles of natural justice. Right back to Manaka Gandhi, we have traveled. In 86, we traveled to Olga Telis. Olga Telis was examining Section 341, 314 of the Bombay Municipal Act, which said that demolition can be made without notice. Court said no. Even if the statute says without notice, that should not be exactly performed. So they, they have put a lid on the statutory exercise saying that no, don't do it in that fashion. You have to give notice to the people whose apartments or whatever are removed, they demolish. So we traveled, for instance, this principle to natural justice. We traveled from 70 Kripak, 78 Maneka, and 86 Volga Tennis. So this evolution, step by step, had really ingrained principles of natural justice through judge-made law into our administrative law, which is now being followed by the executive also to a large extent. So whenever orders are passed, they are largely following it. So this is the effect of a development of administrative law that it brings peace as required and the uh, rule of law will flourish. However, I have to add that we have seen, I have just given an example of principles of natural justice, but there are several other uh, aspects we are not touching because of lack of time and development of administrative law in those subjects. 
But from 2000, 21st century, I don't find that kind of a development as was uh, happening during the tenure of eminent judges. Like, I'm not uh, running down these present uh, judiciary and I'm only trying to comment that administrative law development is now required. Maybe it has to be fulfilled a little bit more. I would know, I'm only appealing to the people who concerned that this should be done. How it is done also, I'll try to contribute my ideas. But I'm saying that let us observe why it has happened. So it's it's not good for the country, but why it has happened that this development which you can find up to say uh, almost up to uh, the end of 20th century, 21st century, what are the landmark judgments of administrative law? The student of uh, administrative law has to follow. Please point out what are the landmark judgments of administrative law in 20, uh, I may be a little old, but uh, I would say that 21st century somehow has not handed over to us those landmark judgments were there from 1970 to almost 2000. What happens if we do not have such development of principles is that courts are bound to employ principles of equity, not of law. As a regular practitioner, I, find I have just been observing that every case in my early days, as I've uh, told you that about my father being inculcating in a, in a, in a, other than court, I can refer to as my father. I've been instructed by him not to refer as, as such, but as my senior when I'm in the court. So I take the liberty to refer to him as my father, so pardon me. So he, I said these principles, and I get emotional about my father, so I just have to stop for it. One second. Uh, I was on the point of uh, the, the development of law post uh, 2001. What happens is it, it, the 226 don't practice administrative law. Don't, in the sense, develop a principle of law when you decide a case. You decide on facts. You decide on facts, then it becomes not really a precedent because for a precedent, you require a ratio. The, if a point is not, legal point is not formulated in a, in a judgment under 226, you would not have a ratio for the judgment. How do I quote that judgment? It becomes uh, definitely uh, uh, a court of record judgment, I can cite it, but I read the entire judgment. What is the principle I, ha I have to follow for the next judgment? Nothing. It is decided on the facts. So my another point which I would like to make is that in every case of 226 and 32, dealing with administrative law, it would be incumbent on the court to formulate a point on which the decision is being made. Let it be an earlier old principle, simple principle, whatever principle. But there should be a ratio of it. Best way is to give a ratio is not the litigant public to understand the ratio reading bit. So the judge himself makes the ratio. That's how I find some of the honorable judges of the Supreme Court nowadays is also writing the principle on which it has been done as a in, in a tablo, in a kind of a uh, block letters. This is the principle. That would really help the litigant public to see this is the new principle on which I have to further, I can follow. This is the development. This is the similar facts arise. I can follow it up. So the need for administrative law is that if it is not followed and developed, there is a danger of what the executive is complaining of, that it would be decided only on facts and it would be decided on only equity there may be injustice, but justice in law should be there for 226 for exercising the Putin's power. I think I have not uh, noticed the time, sir. So excuse me, I am trying to.
a topic will close to my heart therefore i am just pouring out whatever it is so so ultimately let us now come to my last point that i have omitted so much kind of been very critical perhaps of the present situation but how to go about i am a person very optimistic i don't like to criticize if i see any negativity i would like to contribute to make some something which will help to resolve the situation so what is the way to go about i forget about what's happening according to me the way to go about is to empower the as the uh, institution which is saying is saying empower the law it's true it's a very important aspect it should empower the court to develop administrator who are the players in the judiciary it is the lawyers and the judges so how a, a president can be developed in administrative law is the litigant comes he first comes to the lawyer so it is a lawyer who has to take the responsibility of developing this principle that there is a complaint that there is an infraction or some injustice done the client would only come and say this injustice done to me i want redressal this redressal has this injustice has to put in the form of a principle of law by the lawyer so recently some of the uh, rules of writ uh, writ proceedings we are framing in that a column is to be given that writ petition is filed on which principle of administrative law there should be a paragraph where they should say this is the law violated by because 226 can be exercised only when there is a violation of statutory or fundamental right what is the statutory or fundamental right related consequent to that what is illegality committed this is the expertise of lawyer which is required otherwise whatever client tells me i just go and put it in a better english or worse english and then try to convey to the judge it's not what the role of lawyer according to in administrative law he has a great role to play lawyers have to stand up first for the development of administrative law be it a lawyer doing a private citizen or even the government advisers i would say government advisers also and the defend it is for them to advise the government that this is a principle of administrative law which we need to follow we don't follow it is violation of rule of law so both ways lawyers have a great role to play in their preparation of the uh, the steps for the ultimate delivery of the judgment which is pending on all parties how they can do it is that they are, they have followed these principles what is earlier precedent now i am earlier precedent is not sufficient for me i have to be innovative i have to start innovation should start from the lawyer i recall uh, somebody telling an anecdote that in the when the keshavand bharti case was going on ultimately this kana asked mr palkiwala what is that the of the constitution that cannot be amended so the word this is such a felt in his mouth so innovation has come from mr palkiwala that is how it has become a landmark case so lawyer has to innovate and see that this is a principle on which i am going to argue i am not going to only uh, in the song of my client saying that he's been this is hard pressed this is a thing this he's been a uh, very poor man these are all things which normally would come but ultimately it has to be put in the form of a principle of law more particularly administrative law and therefore the learning of lawyer administrative law is very important so he has to depend upon the earlier president the presidents are not sufficient he has to innovate and put it in his petition then comes the role of the judge so the judge's role is also very important when he decides just decides on the appeal it gives to his heart then the judgment is what chancellor's court so what appeals to judge merely would not be the principle of law which can be carried forward on a uh, justice principle on equity principle even if it is an equity principle it has to reduce to a principle of law it can't be simply say i feel that there is injustice done therefore i would allow the repetition 
it should not be done though it may be the ultimate justice but when the delivery of detriment comes it has to be reasoned out as we are saying that the administrator should reason out his order when it comes to detriment that should reason out a 226 order in the form of administrative law principle then there will be development of law. so these two things are very important a, a lawyer doing his part of the role to develop the administrative law and the judge adjudicating and deciding it in that fashion which is a guidance to the executive the executive should never take a judgment which goes against them as kind of apparent or decided against them as a, they should not look at 226 as an adversarial this is another point which i would like to make that executive administrator should never look at the judgments of the court as adversarial but they as a guidance for them to administer in that fashion judiciary is helping them to administer in accordance rule of law this is how rule of law will prevail otherwise if they act like a litigant in an adversarial litigation completely the constitution i can uh, recall some of the principles which uh, even aristocrats have followed or the rulers have followed and the ruler in nizam state there is a principle that if the first case for first stage trial court the government loses the case government would not file an appeal if the litigant if the citizen loses he can file an appeal so that is how they were following so here also i would say that administrative law principle should be that if the government loses it should understand that they are only correcting the course the judge is correcting the course of the administrator they are not trying to run them down they are only trying to put the rule of law in place i am not talking for individual cases or or specifically any uh, particular case there are aberrations there are exceptions to every case i am being little idealistic or utopian but i am saying that this is the way to go a nation of uh, rule of law to be followed so this is what my interest in this administrative law and my uh, principle is i have rather the topic which i have chosen constitutional balancing is required by exercise of administrative law adjudication and making law by the judiciary and following it like a guidance by the administrators in that case it may be a very ideal situation but in that case it would be really enhancing our constitution thank you very much thank you thank you rigram sir uh, maybe go directly to justice ram kumar sir we have, we have seen how <coughs> after month of the infection how dear it is for you to for uh, administrative law and how administrative law forms the soul of the constitution law now uh, the you beautifully stated that the administrative law has got stultified after the 80s uh, and uh, rightly said the reasons constitute the the soul of any administrative quasi judicial or judicial decision now i have one or two doubts if i am a confirmed criminal so my <laughs> my knowledge of administrative law is very little so supposing an order is passed in violation of the principles of national justice yes, i have come across decisions going either way stating either way whether it is voidable or void i i have i am yet to get a final answer from the supreme court is it really void or voidable sir as far as uh... basic case law is concerned it's a void void it's been held that violation of principle that this is a void but we find judges are very often being reluctant to hold it as void very often they are reluctant because uh, what happens is uh, the test of uh, uh, even if it is uh, given notice is given it is futile exercise there is one principle again of administrative law that even if notice is given it will not make any difference it doesn't really serve the purpose 
in particular fact situation yes. even then the supreme court said that you need to give the follow okay. the principle because it's very important you say because it is a guidance for future uh, uh, exercise of power if you say in a particular fact situation maybe it is not required then you are making a law except in giving exception to principle of constitution okay. and it is going in a wrong direction so therefore to preserve the rule that principles and that suggests violation amount to a void order is preserved by saying that even it is a futile exercise you need to follow it exactly sir in fact uh, otherwise uh, even even in such cases the judges are prejudging the issue it wouldn't yes. make any difference even if hearing is given correct correct yes, the judge is prejudging the issue is it not correct there may be a, a situation where if hearing is given the consequence may be different is it not then uh, i how to distinguish between an administrative order and a quasi judicial order we have i have, maybe i am wrong there may be they have seen decisions where especially in criminal law the the constitute the sanction the power to grant prosecution sanction it has been held by in several decisions it yes. is in purely administrative order yes. therefore the accused has no right to hearing right of hearing because it is his right which is going to be curtailed by the grant of prosecution sanction to the complainant but then accused has been held to be having no right of hearing before the sanctioning authority fortunately or unfortunately there is an amendment to the pc act in 19 uh, in 90 uh, that recent amendment wherein they have incorporated if it is a private complaint then the the sanctioning authority should give a opportunity of hearing to the accused so are they marching towards uh, the observance of the principles of natural justice even in administrative uh, sphere and in fact i don't understand the real distinguishing the the distinction between an administrative purely administrative order and a quasi judicial order both are both can be adjudicatory functions is it not uh, there is a the courts have made some distinctions so authors also made that administrative decision making is slightly different from quasi judicial administrative uh, adjudication basically quasi judicial in a broad speaking there will be a list bit in a, in a quasi judicial uh, administrative uh, adjudication whereas in administrative action adjudication there is no list they are only deciding the right whether to be conferred or not conferred or to be followed not followed so list is absent in uh, administrative action list is there in process which comes so that distinction is there but as you say you saying there's a it has been kind of a uh, that division is coming slowly being raised excellent articulation sir thank you thank you thank you ram kumar sir uh, and uh, no one else would be facing issues relating to administrative law and uh, administrative action in action things like that then the advocate general himself sriram sir yes. for to you <laughs> uh, uh see uh, uh i i ought to have logged in a little earlier shridagram garu has been a, a steadfast uh, expositor of administrative law principles into every jurisdiction well i have two or three comments to make he has been straight and uh, to the extent permissible but i don't have uh, the limitations of having to be straight uh, so uh, if the state were to decide that it would not appeal a judgment from article 226 of the constitution on an assumption which is unsafe or on a belief uh, which is far more unthinkable uh, that justice has been made at the hands of a single judge then give us also the times and judges where that assumption was appropriate and uh, with with the current uh, quality of judgment writing with all due respect for sitting judges if they are in the audience and uh, with the pencham for going for broke in uh, abusing uh, the respondents whether or not made party respondents uh, with absolutely uh, Uh, no grounding on the first principles of being sober being articulate being objective i think that would be too much of a position to ask from me so long as i am the advocate 
that's one. And uh, the second issue that I was wanting to uh, raise about was that if there is an incorporation of a rule in the RIT rules that you have to uh, indicate in some pressy writing as to which is the principle of administrative law, uh, which gives the basis for the cause of action, what is the law violated, and what is uh, the rule on the basis of which consequences are sought. I'm assuming that uh, there would be an equivalent rule for the judges also to indicate as to what is the basis and why is it that they have gone this path and uh, as to what is the legal basis uh, for granting relief or refusing relief. And that would be too much of an onerous duty uh, for honorable judges to perform today because most of the judgments as we are aware uh, do not reflect uh, the uh, correct process of adjudication. Uh, so uh, aside that, and he knows I, I try to uh, take liberties with him and therefore I've uh, uh, gone on in this uh, light. Uh, yes, uh, I think a little of, uh, he, he always keeps saying, uh, and he keeps uh, uh, quoting Wade in almost every uh, matter in court, a little understanding of the consequences by the decision maker or the, uh, the uh, significance of objectivity in collation of facts, which according to me is a ministerial act. I have seen the government's functioning. The collation of facts is never done by the officer taking the decision. It is done by the subordinate officers. Even the facts ascertainment is done very, very casually. And uh, the, the reasons to the reasons to decision, the journey is never begun. If it is begun, it is waylaid. And if it is begun and continued further, the decision is horrendous. So I think it's time that Mr. Sriragram took all my officers on an administrative law vacation to a Eastern <laughs> European country and then drill into them some finer points of administrative law so that some litigation at my hand can come down. Always a bliss hearing uh, Mr. Sri Raghuram. Sri yeah, Raghuram, very nice to see you. And uh, in fact, uh, some of the cases we are appearing together and some cases against. Always a pleasure both ways. Uh, <laughs> Answering, I think, uh, you know, what uh, you said, the second point, first, uh, I said that uh, one observation is 21st century has not produced many landmark judgments of administrative law. is a reflection not only on judges, but also advocates, as I said, but somehow we are not able to get that judgment. So definitely, uh, and I said about uh, the petition to reflect the principle of administrative law, I also said, that judge while adjudicating need to decide on that principle. If he, if he doesn't do it, then it's, it's not a proper adjudication because when a petitioner comes and says, this is the law, sir, violated, and you just decide, either you dismiss it saying that it's not violated or you allow it saying that it is so and he are not satisfied, you can add something and improve it. But it is mandatory, I would say, in the sense that it is a good adjudication, I would put it as good adjudication, that they have to deal with the principle later. It's a, in a CPC also, all issues raised have to be answered, Article 14. So Order 14 ought to be followed by even uh, judges in adjudication 226. Once point is raised, they need to follow it. Otherwise, that's what I was saying. If they don't follow, those judgments are chanceless courts. What is the point? Deciding on facts makes it is not having instant value, but still it's court of record order. They will say that uh, in a similar case, they have followed. What is that similar case followed? And then what is the principle or nothing? On facts, I have a similar case. Please give me the same relief. So this is how we are kind of uh, uh, going down the uh, gradient of uh, merit. So the improve the merit, we need to definitely, both the parties, judges and lawyers, both have to come together and say. And about the executive's uh, difficulty, I was only trying to say that the executive might have might face bad judgments and then face the problems. They'll definitely have, for instance, every judgment against them, 
would they would feel that it is coming via their administration they would feel that as lawyers and as uh, school of law if it is sustained in in administrative law i am only there then it, it is excuse us to take it like it's a course correction let's not say as if they are coming in, in this is what i am trying to uh, put as a principle it's a course correction with the judge who is along with you is another constitutional functionary you are a constitutional functionary you are doing your job but i am given a job to correct you so don't think that i'm stopping you i'm only trying to correct but i'm only speaking very ideally no, i'm not saying in a case or two case so ideally this is the way to go about this is the way and uh, all of us are very lucky uh, just a clarification uh, gentlemen this is not wine this is watermelon <laughs> you <could easily> make <laughs> can make that distinction you have, uh, you have violated the procedure you should have offered it first to us natural just <laughs> if i have to offer i'll have i'll offer something portable depending on the class of the audience this is watermelon yeah <laughs> nice. appearances watermelon. are deceptive <laughs> <laughs> very nice sir thank you uh, dilip sir so we in yester years we had advocate journals who used to say that mr chief minister the advocate journal is here not to uh, defend all your illegal orders so don't come to me with such such, such patent illegal orders gone are those days no they are all political refugees short short of short of making applications to the chief minister for being appointed as advocate general everything else is going on nowadays so the the, the parameters that used to be there including the pleasure doctrine and pleasure were both ways <laughs> pleasure doctrine was both ways so i mean those uh, situations have long gone and uh, we are into tougher situations but speaking for myself uh, uh, <clears throat> it would have been a far bigger dis a disaster if i had said yes to everything that was coming my way <laughs> <laughs> absolutely dilip sir thank you sam sir sir it was a very well articulated erudite exposition on the subject thank you very much sir and my 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 query is with regard to two aspects one is regarding the precedent going with the principles of charity decisions a precedent made by a constitutional court is binding on subordinate and suppose divergent findings on the same issue in ideal situation by co equal strength courts of co equal strength comes which will be binding on the or can be said that the subordinate court is uh, bound to take i mean uh, take attacks on both and distinguish or i mean there is nothing to distinguish because divergent finding divergent ratio on similar set of facts given by co equal to a court of co equal strength then which will be binding and what will what will be the i mean remedy for so the simple principle is suppose coordinate in just like If they are divergent opinion, the law is that it has to refer to a divergent bench for a proper uh, finalization of that issue. So that is how the rule say and the principles also follow. The law president say that they have to refer to a, a larger bench. That, that, is, that, is, that doesn't happen because why? Well, if suppose uh, I file an application, I mean, saying that see this is the, the decision rendered by such and such judge. He says that there is another decision, and he'll he be out for the other decision. I am out. I am out of the thing. So the lawyers have to decide that we have to say that uh, you can't decide like this. You refer to decision points. You don't refer to decision points. Take it away. I don't have to advise how to uh, how to handle a bad judgment. But the principle is that there's a conflict of opinion in a coordinate. In this, it goes to higher. A division bench uh, uh, difference will go to a full bench. A full bench difference will go to full bench, larger bench. This is a law of precedence. But as you said, there are oh, judges who say that I won't follow. Yes. Okay. You suppose judge says I won't follow. What is that you and I can do? I can only uh, nothing else can be done by a lawyer except say, sir, please follow it. Because I don't follow. This is a bad judgment. It has to be dealt with like a bad judgment. Is it not indiscipline? Judicial indiscipline. 
for a judge to say that I will not we'll, follow. We'll, uh, we'll have a debate on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a law, so much of indiscipline going on, so I think it takes uh, quite we some had, time. Uh, <laughs> we had Justice MP Menon in Kerala, I go. When, con when two conflicting division bench rulings were cited before him, he referred the matter to a larger bench. And in the reference order said, law may be an ass, but he should bray in the same voice from the same compound. Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Yes, sir. Actually, worse than the, the uh, indiscipline is the correction. Uh, if we go by what happened in the land acquisition challenge case, then it goes back to the same judge. And the same judge says, trust me, so loudly that everybody knew what the result is going to be. And then it was going to be a full, uh, larger bench reference from... Uh, the same composition. So I think these are all major areas of discomfort that all of us have been facing. A few of us have been speaking aloud. A few mature, uh, organized uh, uh, men like Mr. Sri Raghuram laugh it away. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the second second point is regarding see whether the question whether the administrative law is applicable only to executive uh, procedures or. Is it applicable to judicial proceedings? As uh, rightly said, uh, it is applicable to judicial proceedings also. Yes, yes. Then, then, then. So, in, I, I'll cite an example. In Surface Act, Section 40, gives the power to a metropolitan magistrate or the chief judicial magistrate to help the petitioner to uh, I mean, take physical possession from the borrower under Surface Act. Surface Act. Uh, surface Act. Uh, but but uh, the Supreme Court, uh, in so many decisions, have said that it is only an administrative act and the accused, I mean, the, the borrower need not be any notice at all. But what is being taken away is his valuable property. He may have so many objections to make in the petition because after, after this amendment in 2012, then there are so many parameters attached to a petition for taking possession through the judicial intervention. And these documents, these, these parameters have to be fulfilled by the petition before taking help or seeking remedy from the court. But the court saying that there is a Supreme Court decision saying that this is, a, I'm just like a post office. After the petitioner comes and asks me something, I give it to him. And I'm not bound by, I'm not uh, bound to give notice to the adversary. So, the, I think you're referring to Justice Chalamet. Yes. Uh, okay. yes. So and, I would and, say and, 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 I would say we are referring to a bad judgment. That, way, that the principle laid down in fourteen that yes. uh, you can you can take without notice and, 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 and there I'm, is a I'm, procedure I'm, also. I'm citing a decision. I mean, I'm citing an occasion where I had to say that the Surface Act was could not be initiated in the instance because right. the property was an agricultural property. Right. So the court court ought to have at least gone into that. Whether the surface, see, section 15 is a part of the proceeding under surface act. So if surface act itself is not applicable, cannot be made use of by the petitioner. Okay. No, principles of natural justice should have been more yes. strictly followed because they almost expropriated law in the sense taking yes. away the property. So you need to follow principle of natural justice very strictly. Yes, Saying yes. that minister need not give notice is really horrendous. Uh, I have argued that proposition. Uh -huh. um, so and it's a case of bad judgment, sir. I have been very idealistic in my principles. I have yes. not quoted case law. As you said, cases are there, like you no know, aberrations are there and the wrong judgments are there. But I was only trying to go through the track of uh, an ideal way of putting forward the, rather uh, taking forward the administrative law principles and then go to an ideal situation. I was not, Sri Ram would be having those complaints that every day we face wrong judgment. In fact, we are already arguing so many cases where <laughs> fundamental principles are not followed. So that is for a one good day we'll have. Why, why a judge is giving a bad judgment? Nobody knows. Mm. Because Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras ultimately said that you develop a, a power, what we call Samyamana, if you follow all the principles, all those practices, you get a power that if you focus on your forehead, you will know the future you focus on your back of the head, you know the past, and you focus on other man's face, you know what his mind is, 
but you will never know what he is going to do with that mind yes so you will never know how a judge would react you can therefore lawyers job is absolutely almost an impossible job we do because we are trying to change the mind of the judge no it is not possible you are only trying to feed everything and let him decide so why judge gives the wrong judgment absolutely it is his uh, maybe a honorable judges may be there on the panel i don't know but it's ultimately uh, again i come back to my great father he said rajyante narakam dhruvam so if you make a mistake it is for them rajyante narakam dhruvam so one chief justice said sir you mean to say for everyone sir almost everyone unless you don't make mistakes so <laughs> Thank you. I'm only lighter, sir. I'm just saying that mistakes are mistakes. Lawyers, lawyers make mistakes. Judges make mistakes. But today we are on what is the path we need to take yes. to get an ideal situation. Let us uh, hope. Let us improve the situation. Otherwise, one day we can discuss what are those because several principles are there of administrative law, which uh, unfortunately the courts are not following. Very fundamental questions they raise and then don't follow. I'll give you one example, two or three examples. If there is an illegal order, it is set aside very well by judge. He is con convinced that it's an illegal order, and apply the doctrine of ultra virus and say this order is set aside. But that as a human being is looking at. I'm not faulting them. Actually, if you look at what happens by set aside this order, then what will happen to the person who got benefit of this order? what will happen so wade in his statement says so don't bother judge's role is to correct the course so when there is an ultra virus order he is in his language he says please set aside the order and please don't do anything more than that he cautions don't do anything more than that because that ultra virus order passed by the administrator is responsible for passing that order he knows what to do if that order is set aside it is not for the court to again administer it in a fashion which is contrary to what the administrator has done so these are very uh, very good principles which the court should follow basically in all matters so that is what my uh, my case is today and file file of just need to follow the principles otherwise there will be really lot of injustice and lot of uh, what you call unrest in the people This is very important uh, uh, part of the public life. Two twenty six exercise. You can see the initially when I joined profession, I was told that please go into the admission courts and just sit there. The entire scenario, political scenario, or like in the state would be reflected in the admission court. What is happening everywhere? We just reflected in the admission court. Today there is some law passed which is affecting the challenge. Somebody's house is demolished. That is the question. Somebody is demoted. It is the question. So what is happening around? You know, it is the question. Registration is not being done. Batch of hundred cases every day in the court. The registration is not being affected. So you find it in the courts. So it's a such a important facet of the public life that uh, this power. and it should be preserved if 226 is the heart of constitution according to me thank you very much sir okay thank you dilip sir radha krishna mohit sir yeah me what to say and on <laughs> you know pretty well that the the r star wars that they have already said so and on nothing more to say anything in that actually see i am very weak in this subject and all that's the reason actually hard to speak radha krishna if you are you reflecting on me it's a reflection on me You say you are weak. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so, initial days and all, I have not concentrated on this subject and all. Though you are, of course, the other star wall that they have already said. That's the reason. Mostly, I am not practicing on the high, uh, the high court side and all. Mostly, I am going to the civil courts. Okay. Yeah, I am not good at uh, administrator. Though my guru is very strong in that. <laughs> yes. now uh, sir uh, as we come to the end of the 261st session may I request kvj rao sir to render the concluding remarks sir agarwal garu good evening sir good evening sir 
excellent articulation and uh, like i would like to put to rest just as ram kumar's question that if no notice is served the founding fathers were very uh, what should i say foresighted that's why they included 2263 in the constitution and the powers are so great that if your opponent doesn't come within 15 days or the court sumoto doesn't take it up the relief granted disappears so the founding fathers had a vision yes. uh, raghuram garu i am i am an accidental lawyer i i was flying for air india exposing corruption so executive uh, administrative law is part of where i come from exposing it yeah. and what you have said today is absolutely right sir so i mean that the and as shriram sir also said today most of the litigants uh, or i should i put it 60% of the litigation is by government and that is because there is no lack of that is because of lack of accountability you see the state pays for everything and that's why if you read uh, yesterday's judgment by the honorable supreme court in state of orissa versus uh, mohanty they have come down on the administrative principles there are seven judgments which have been quoted as to what how the public figure should uh, behave in public life and principles of natural justice is read into uh, that judgment so the, i mean that's one good thing and sir basically ad- people have forgotten administrative law because there is no administrative administration left sir i mean i i i would take this liberty my father was an accounts man i come from the erstwhile polwaram zamindar family sir okay i'm i'm now i have the responsibility of the patisima temple as a hereditary trustee uh, on my shoulders i live in bombay but uh, i do visit polwaram very often so that's one thing my father was an accounts man and in 71 he went into administration because the air india formed a job evaluation committee to lay down the parameters to grade the work and he was so good that air india retained him in uh, administrative and for 28 years this single man held fort with 32 public sector undertakings and 19 unions of air india single handedly so i am very proud of the lineage that i come from and he always wanted me to study law because he was very close to fali nariman soli sarab ji because they were all lawyers for air india but i didn't follow that i went into a total different line so he was unhappy and now he is happy that i have at least learning law in the last 10 years he watched me do what i am doing and the way i fight the system so he says nin mundre cheppeno i mean i told you earlier but then you didn't listen to me i knew what you were yeah. capable of but uh, you didn't listen to me coming back sir but sir excellent articulation i mean there is nothing left but unfortunately like even shriram sir said you have said dilip sir has said 141 is is forgotten today sir article 141 is totally forgotten and that increases the burden on the higher courts i mean if you are talking of docket explosion it starts from there basically because the lower courts don't actually function I mean, for a one fifty six three order, it takes me one and a half years, and I, now it's taken me six years to get an order which is being challenged now. So, had it been followed in in principle in the beginning, administrative law, a lot of problems, a lot of matters in court would have been uh, resolved a long time back. And anyway, sir, thank you very much. I mean, we re- it's a pleasure hearing you, and uh, learned a lot today, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul sir. Uh, we have Vijay back on our platform. The family member is back. Vijay, please. Okay. No, no. I was following. I was hearing uh, Sri Guru Sir speak. They talk through and through. It's always a pleasure to hear him in court and here. Uh, very few councils have the ability to do talk about Patanjali and uh, Wade on administrative law in the same uh, lecture. It's always an interesting thing. He's very one of those original thinkers. and he did say one of those days that he was my senior in my office <laughs> so sir it's always a pleasure hearing you sir thank you one point sir just one yes sir uh, uh, lack of time i do not press innovation i wanted to say lawyers what role lawyers can play uh, we in india don't have any statute you know normally or a judge saying that it is part of the status per se delay 
of any action uh, is whether abuse of the process or abuse of the uh, executive action. So, there are a number of cases, both in England as well as in America. In America, they have laid down rules in the Administrative Procedures Act. I think it's both section 716 something. Where if there is a delay on that, there is some, some penalty. Then courts also ruled it. So therefore, they have protection both under the APA, that is Administrative, Administrative Procedures Act, as well as under the judicial review against per se delay. For example, any some action, a grant of a uh, article license or a record of rights patta, they take, suppose, unreasonable time, then only course available to uh, it again is to go to court and say, please dispose of my application. Court will not do anything more than just directing them to dispose of. So you deal direct, maybe say within so and so time, normally it is followed by contempt or whatever. But if it's a good uh, officer, he will follow it. But what should happen to the earlier period of one year? So this is the area where lawyers can innovate and courts can come in. If the, it is, for instance, it, a, a penalty is levied, a judgment is decided saying that if you go take unreasonable time beyond this, there shall be a penalty. It should be a deterrent. Law should be such, judgment should be such that it would be a deterrent for the administrator to violate law. So these are the areas where administrative law can be developed, innovated, and then judges can lay down the law. Role of lawyers as well as the judges. Sorry, I think I've extended my... I think uh, so we, have a, we have a similar law in Kerala, but it is yes. more honored in its breach than observance. <laughs> yes. In Kerala, sir... Uh, yes, we have a just law. I came to Kerala... Uh, I came to Kerala and saw in one court, the entire court was dealing with only one subject, that is, represent the lawyer would get up and say P9 or P6. That is a representation made to the government. Court would order some time fixation and then order them. In all cases only to dispose of the representations. <laughs> so this is how the administration is. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Very thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, uh, let us... Uh, um, for once, uh, uh, we did change the timing from morning till evening hour to evening in on a Sunday, and it's really wonderful, sir, that how a Sunday evening could be well spent. And uh, I that too in our 261st session. And thank you very much, sir, for uh, addressing us. And that too on a very short notice. And special thanks to Radha Krishna Murthy for uh, managing this splendid task. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we are also thankful to Justice Swami Ajulu, sir, for entering the introductory remarks. Sriram sir, as usual, plastic and on to the point. Thank you very much for being present. And uh, uh, this is Ram Kumar sir, thank you for uh, uh, valuable presence and inputs. And all of you wonderful participants for being part and parcel of this journey of discovery, enlightenment, and empowerment. So, once again, thank you, sir. And uh, till we meet again next week, please do take care and stay safe. Thank you.